All right, so hopefully you guys have done the homework for chapter 27 because now we're kind of getting into the nuts and bolts and the introduction to your actual trauma section. All right. So we're kind of, during this point, we're going to kind of go over kinetics of trauma, MOI or mechanism of injury, multi-system trauma patient, what we call the golden hour, okay, or the golden period or platinum 10 minutes, trauma system, and the golden principles of the trauma system itself. All right, so during this les uh, lesson, you guys are going to decide about making judgments, how you can not only recognize obvious injuries, but also maintain a high index of suspicion, all right, for hidden injuries. And we're going to hopefully you have an understanding of mechanism of injury is the chief component of this crucial assessment skill, okay? So how severely a person is injured depends on the force with which he collides with something, all right? or velocity, okay, and something collides with him. So this force depends partly on the energy contained in the moving body or bodies, all right? So the energy contained in a moving object is called kinetic energy. And velocity of that object plays a huge, huge part in the kinetic energy itself and how it's delivered. So mass and velocity. So kinetic energy is equal to mass times velocity squared divided by two. Kinetic energy is a moving in a moving body is calculated this way all right the formula il illustrated that you just saw that has a mass of a moving object is doubled its kinetic energy is also doubled you would be injured twice as badly if you were hit by a two pound rock as if you were hit by a one pound rock thrown at the same speed okay Velocity is a much more significant factor than mass is. Suppose you are hit by a rock thrown at a velocity of one foot per second and then hit by the same rock thrown again at two feet per second. The rock thrown at two feet per second okay, would not be twice as harmful as a one foot per second but would be four times as harmful because the factor of that velocity is squared. So understanding the factor of velocity is important in evaluating the mechanism of injury in vehicle collisions. So during your scene, size up as you try to get an idea of how seriously the vehicle passengers may have been injured, it's important to ask the question or try to get an estimate of how fast the vehicle was going at the time of the collision. And did it hit a fixed object or did it hit another object coming at it? Okay. The rate at which a body is in motion increases its speed Okay, known as acceleration. The rate at which a body in motion decreases its speed is known as deceleration. If one car is braked to a gradual stop and the other is stopped suddenly by striking a telephone pole, the one with the faster rate of deceleration, okay, the one that struck the pole, is going to exert more force. If kinetic energy transmitted to a human body continues to travel, in a straight line without interruption, injury may not occur. However, energy traveled through the human body is frequently interrupted by the body itself or deflected. By complaining, I'm sorry, by comparing the number of impacts, it is easy to understand why a person in or on a moving vehicle gets thrown, okay? has a much greater chance for injury than one who is restrained or remains in the vehicle. Because we have vehicle collision, okay, then the body hits the vehicle, and then the organs hit the inside of the body. All right? Because you got to remember, they're just held on by a band or what the vessels, ligaments, and tendons, they're very elastic. So when that body hits the steering wheel, the organs are still being propelled forward because of the velocity that the body was initially moving in. So then once the organs smack the inside of the musculoskeletal system, they bounce back, causing contusions or tears in these vessels or ligaments and tendons, causing issues. So, got to think. Critical thinking discussion. Let's think about if we have a family member who refuses to wear a seatbelt because he states he is afraid that he is in a crash into a body of water, okay, and he might not be able to get his seatbelt off and would drown. So think about what you might say to this person to convince that person that they would need to wear a seatbelt, all right? The patient comes to a quick stop. So the patient, let's say the car is going at 70 miles an hour and it veers off the side of the road and hits a tree, a very large oak tree that's not going to budge, okay? So then they come to a quick stop. 
Okay, and then some parts or parts of the inside of the vehicle, such as the steering wheel. Okay, so fixed object, vehicle hits object. Okay, then body hits vehicle, causing the organs to be propelled forward, as you can see here, smacking the inside of the sternal wall. Okay, then they bounce back, and as a result of that sudden propulsion forward, the aorta can tear, the muscles that hold these organs in place can tear, ligaments or tendons can tear, okay, and then the impact to the inside of the sternal border, all right, is going to cause bruising or contusions or the small capillaries to rupture, causing pericardial sac to fill, causing pleural contusions, causing difficulty breathing, causing chest pain, all right. So this is where you have to be careful when you're asking this patient, do you have chest pain? And the answer is yes, and they were in a car accident, all right? There's a high risk that the small vessels that surround the heart can be torn or be leaking. So a medical chest pain, yes, I'm going to give aspirin and nitro to. I'm going to give a antiplatelet, and I'm going to give a vasodilator. But if this patient has received trauma to the chest, okay, and they had chest pain after the trauma, the last thing you want to do is cause them to bleed out, okay, by giving them an antiplatelet, which prevents them from clotting, and giving them a vasodilator when the body wants to constrict to repair itself, okay? So with any understanding of the mechanism of injury, you're going to be able to arrive on scene of a vehicle collision and suspect simply from looking at the damaged vehicle which types of trauma the patient may have experienced, okay? A force severe enough to kill one passenger will almost certainly cause severe injuries in the other, okay, to all other passengers in the same compartment. One of the earliest signs of brain injury is altered mental status or unresponsiveness. So consider the patient's mental status prior to your arrival when determining a baseline mental status, especially in the patient with a suspected hand injury. Intrusion of the vehicle is a deformity occurring to the interior compartment. The occupant site is anywhere in the vehicle where the patient was riding. A patient who has been partially or even completely ejected from the vehicle is at a much greater risk of injury than one who was remained inside the vehicle. So studies have shown that mechan mechanical aspects of the vehicle collisions can predict injury in most motor vehicle crashes. So data from telemetry systems such as seatbelt use, direction of impact, and change in velocity provide the most important predictors all right, of severity of injury. Things like frontal impact, rear impact, rotational or lateral, okay? So frontal impact would be the front end of the vehicle comes in contact with either a fixed or another moving object. Rear impact, that's that uh, coup contra coup injury. Brain smacks the front of the head, then the back of the head, whiplash, okay? Lateral or rotational impact, so hitting the end like a pit maneuver on a vehicle. All right, that car is going to spin, and as that car spins, there's things in the vehicle that can cause and act as projectiles, causing injuries. So in the frontal impact, the driver continues to move forward at the same speed the vehicle is traveling. So if the vehicle is going at 70 miles per hour, the human is going at 75 miles per hour. So when that vehicle comes to a dead stop because it hit a tree, that body the human body is still traveling at 70 miles per hour. So then it's going to hit the steering wheel at 70 miles per hour. All right, so you got to think about that. An abdominal and possible ejection through the windshield can be extremely detrimental. Okay, and they go under the steering wheel, causing injuries to the knees, femurs, hips, pelvis, and or spine. Okay. If they're unrestrained and the vehicle involved in a collision travel in and up, and over direction, they may be ejected from the vehicle, okay? The abdomen, a damaged dashboard or steering wheel should cause you to suspect abdominal injuries as the abdomen strikes the dashboard or steering wheel. The liver, spleen, hollow organs of the abdomen are compressed between the front and back abdominal walls and the spine. The hollow organs are more easily displaced leaving the solid liver and spleen to bear the brunt of the compression. The chest, as the chest hits the dashboard or the steering wheel, bones and soft tissue are both affected. The ribs and sternum can break. The cartilage connecting the ribs to the sternum can separate. A torn intercostal artery can bleed 50 milliliters per minute into the chest cavity with no blood seen externally. The heart and lungs are the major organs affected, so the heart suffers 
the effects of two forces, compression and a shearing force. Compression force occurs when the heart is caught between the sternum and the spine, which can bruise the heart muscle. The heart is suspended by the aorta, which is attached posteriorly at the arch by a ligament. So the shear force tends to pull the aorta at the ligament, which can tear, or what they call transect the aorta. The lungs can also be affected. Air trapped in the lungs by sudden closure of the epiglottis is compressed between the ribs or the spine. This is called a compression injury. It's also called what we call a paper bag injury. So think about taking a brown paper bag, closing it off, blowing it up, and then closing it shut, trapping the air inside that brown paper bag. And then from a distance, take your hand and smack the bag as hard as you can, and it's going to pop. That's very similar, if not identical, to what happens to your lungs when you have a compression injury, okay? It's called a brown bag effect. Your head, face, and neck are next to the impact and deployed airbag, dashboard, windshield, or window, depending on whether there's more of more than one impact. So as you approach the vehicle, check for the typical starburst windshield cracking. Depending on the impact point, the face can be have extensive, extensive soft tissue damage. Head injuries usually result when the occupant is ejected from the vehicle and skull fractures can almost certainly occur. Common example, more of a picture, points of impact you see at the hip, the chest, the neck, and the head. Okay, more realistic. Here's a uh, more kind of descriptive or a more picture of that brown bag effect that we were talking about. The driver that goes down and under the steering wheel is subject to injuries to the knees, femurs, hips, and pelvis. It's the points of impact of a down and under. Again, compression to that femur can cause it to snap. Or if the femur doesn't snap, that energy is then transferred to the hip bone, which can cause it to break. Frontal impacts, okay, can be fractured hip or pelvis, a dislocated hip or knee, neck injuries, facial injuries. The body's propelled forward by the seat while the head and neck tend to remain at rest. So that's why it's important that when you're driving, that headrest is there for a reason on your seat. It prevents that head from being propelled backwards, okay, minimizing that coup contra coup injury or that whiplash. An improperly positioned headrest that is pushed all the way down to restrain the neck and not the head can contribute to the severity of the injury. Okay, example shown here. Rear end impact on the top, no headrest. Head and neck get shot backwards causing damage to the cervical spine. Mechanism of injury. Head and neck, as the energy of the impact is absorbed, the body is pushed laterally out from under the head. This causes the head to move in the opposite direction. Chest and abdomen injuries occur when the door strikes the side of the chest and abdomen if the impact is on the shoulder or the energy traveling in a straight line may dissipate the curve in the, in the clavicle, resulting in a fracture. So if the arm is caught between the door and the chest, or if the door hits the chest, fractured ribs can flail segments are possible. The pelvis, the impact of the vehicle door to the chest will also cause a lateral impact to the pelvis. So fractures of the pelvis and upper femur usually complete this pattern. Again, example here, this car was fortunate enough to have side impact airbags. Okay, side impact airbags help from the head hitting the window or hitting the glass, but you notice the intrusion into the door. The metal or the inside of that door could have struck the body, as you see here, okay, causing injuries. The vehicle spins around on a rotational injury or rollover, okay? The vehicle spins around causing the occupant who are not restrained to strike the mirror, post, doors, resulting in many injuries from all different directions. Both head and lateral injury patterns will occur during a rotational or a rollover. The vehicle hits the ground in multiple times in various places. 
the occupant changes direction every time the vehicle does. So although a specific pattern of injury is impossible to predict in a rollover, there are a few common characteristics. First, multiple system injury is common. Second, ejection is common if the occupant was not restrained. And then finally, you might get some crushing injuries to ejected occupants because the vehicle rolls over on top of them. Okay, during a rollover, the vehicle hits the ground multiple times and in various places like we discussed. Okay, has a higher center of gravity, such as sports utility vehicles and vans are more prone to rollovers. So following the laws of motion kind of described here as the vehicle rotates and turns, each impact the body hits that section of the vehicle. So things can be impacted such as the gear shift, such as the steering wheel, the dash, and each impact causes damage, break, vessels to shear or tear, right? So the patterns of injury are likely to be different in children than in adults, all right? This is because adults are larger and have a different weight distribution. Also, children and adults react to an impending collision differently. A child who is about to be hit by a vehicle whether the child is walking or riding a bicycle generally turns toward the oncoming vehicle. So injuries from the impact are generally to the front of the body. Okay? As an adult, on the other hand, usually turns away from the oncoming vehicle. So the most common impact is to the side of the body. Okay? Children aren't aware that this is a bad thing, that a vehicle coming at them. So they turn to look because of the curiosity. So that's where that pattern comes from. With adults, we tend to learn through age that we tend to shy away or we tend to put up kind of a defensive posture and then resulting causes us to get hit from the side or even turn completely away and get hit in the back. Hidden injuries, all right, lap belts when worn properly, distribute force across the iliac crest of the pelvis. So the lap belt prevents the occupant from being ejected, but without a shoulder strap, it does not prevent the chest from striking the steering wheel. All right, so compression fractures of the lumbar spine occur as the torso is forcibly flexed forward, and if the seat belt is worn too low, it can actually dislocate the hips. So all you people out there who don't like the seat belt rubbing your neck, and you put the lap belt on, but then you take the shoulder belt and throw it behind your head, you're probably laughing because you know you do that, okay? Things like this can happen. So yeah, your hips are safe, but your top of your body, the heaviest portion, is going to be propelled forward and hit the steering wheel. All right? Seatbelt injury patterns, as you can see here, okay? You get the bruising and the abrasion, all right? But the bones and the hips are still intact. So you might have some slight, some minimal bruising and some slight bleeding to the area, all right? But these are things that can heal. So to prevent head snapping, the proper position for the car seat is to be facing backwards and recline to a 45 degree angle. To, complete avo to completely avoid injury from the airbag deployment, children should always be restrained in a back seat of the vehicle and not in the front. Okay, so laying the bike down in a motorcycle collision is an evasion action of the part of the rider. All right, designated to prevent ejection and separation of the driver from the bike in an impending collision. So the bike is always turned sideways and then laid down with the driver's inside leg dragging on the pavement or ground. So the driver tends to lose speed faster than the bike, thus moving the bike out from under the driver. So abrasions can range from superficial abrasions involving only the epidermis to full thickness abrasions which extend to the subcutaneous tissue and severe cases to the covering of the bone. So you can actually tear the skin down to the bone itself. So abrasions can be complicated but particles embedded in the tissue such as dirt, grass, and asphalt. Okay, You can see injury patterns such as this. So boots, leather clothing, and helmet help protect against soft tissue damage as you can see here commonly called road rash and against head and facial injuries. Okay, a helmet could have prevented an injury like this. Okay, ATVs, unsteady, very easily tipped over. All right, they're very similar to motor vehicle collisions because 90% of the time people don't wear safety equipment with these entertainment vehicles. Okay, they go out for fun, they have a good time, they jump hi uh, hills, run through mud, in terrain that you can't really see that far ahead of you. So there can be holes that can cause the vehicle to tip over. They can lose balance extremely quickly. All right. 
So some of the severe mechanism of injury that we need to worry about or cause internal organ damage is frequent. And you should hold a high index of suspicion for what you see here in this slide. Okay, the pattern of trauma injuries also depends on the body part that impacts first. All right. <clears throat> for instance, a fall with a feet first fall. So a feet first landing causes energy to travel up the skeletal system. So the energy first impacts the heels and then that kinetic energy is transferred up the bones and then into the back. All right, where you can get compression injuries to the spine, to the femurs, to the hips. All right. And again, distance and velocity hold a big part in this. So me falling five feet off the porch is going to yield not as much of a problem as falling 20 feet off of a roof feet first. Okay, here's kind of a more visual example of what we talked about. So head first falls. Pattern of injury begins with the arms and extends up the shoulders. Why? Because most of the time when you fall head first, your natural instinct is to put your hands up to try to protect your head or to catch yourself. So this, the head is forcibly hyperextended, hyperflexed or compressed, all of which can cause extensive damage to the cervical spine. Elbows, okay, humerus, radius, ulna. So penetrating injuries, either by low, medium, or high velocity rounds, can penetrate the surface of the body, such as bullets, darts, nails, or knives. The amount of damage that results depends on how much kinetic energy transferred to the tissue in the area of body that it penetrates. The amount of kinetic energy transferred to the tissue is the greatest indicator of potential damage, or what we call cavitation. All right, so for example, if the object is a knife, the low kinetic energy limits the damage to just immediate site of impact in the underlying structures. The higher the kinetic energy, say of a bullet, results in tissue damage extending relatively far from the site of the impact, which yields what we've talked about before, an exit wound. Okay, so if the kinetic energy produced by the bullet is totally absorbed by the body tissues, the bullet will not exit. But if the kinetic energy remains with the bullet, however, there will be an exit wound present. Someone stabbed from behind, for instance, with a left upper chest with a short three-inch paring knife may suffer a pneumothorax, air in the chest cavity. Okay? If stabbed with an eight-inch knife, the injuries can include lacerated pulmonary veins, lacerated aorta, and even laceration to the heart itself. Shotgun wounds differ significantly from the rifle or handgun wounds because shotguns have multiple pellets that spray in a pattern. So the multiple pellets increase the impact surface area, thus increasing the amount of energy transferred to the tissues. Close range shotgun wounds can cause devastating tissue damage. We have to think about traje trajectory, the path or the motion of a projectile during its travel. Dissipation of the energy, the way the energy is transferred to the human body from the force acting on it. Then you have the drag of the object, okay? That's what That force that slows the bullet down, such as wind, resistance, constitutes drag. The profile, the impact point of the bullet is its profile. The greater the size of the impact point, the more energy that was transferred. And then two, a couple slides ago, you heard me mention the term cavitation. Sometimes called pathway expansion, cavitation is the cavity in the body tissue formed by a pressure wave resulting from the kinetic energy of the bullet. Cavitation greatly extends the tissue damage beyond the initial bullet pathway itself. So that is the hole created in the tissue is larger than the diameter of the bullet. Blown out tissue caused by cavitation and carried along with the bullet explains why the exit wound is always larger then the entry wound. So then you have fragmentation. A bullet that breaks up into smaller pieces or releases small pieces upon impact increases the body damage. So the fragments increase the frontal impact area and create greater tissue damage with injuries spread over a larger area of the body.